My name is Bill Callery. I'm Manager of Programs and Knowledge Exchange at the Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance of Canada, or CDPAC. Um, just a little bit about CDPAC for anyone who's not familiar. We've been around for about 15 years, and we're a network of many of Canada's largest national health charities and professional associations who've come together to advocate for and share knowledge about research, surveillance, policies, and programs for promoting health and preventing chronic diseases in Canada. Uh, our website and social media contacts are at the bottom, so I encourage you to connect with us and visit our website to learn more. So today's webinar is in collaboration with Participant Action and is entitled, Are Kids Too Tired to Move? Results from the 2016 Participant Action Report Card on Physical Activity for Children and Youth. Um, it's really great to be working with Participant Action to bring you this webinar, which is going to present results from the 2016 report card, including highlighting the new 24-hour guidelines, grades for each indicator, and what this research means for Canadian children. The webinar will also highlight key findings, research gaps, and areas of opportunity to improve healthy active living among children and youth. We're hoping you'll be able to take away recommendations for turning research into action, as well as tools and resources to support the use of the report card and the 24-hour guidelines in your settings. So, on behalf of CDPAC and our co-hosts at Participation, I'd like to wish you a warm welcome and thanks very much for joining. I'm really pleased to present our two presenters today, Dr. Alana LeBlanc and Veronica Portress. Alana LeBlanc is the Knowledge Manager at Participation and the Project Lead for the Participation Report Card. She has a PhD in Population Health from the University of Ottawa, is a Certified Exercise Physiologist with the Canadian Society for Ex Exercise Physiology, uh, a Clinical Exercise Specialist with the American College of Sports Medicine, and a physical activity and public health specialist with the American College of Sports Medicine National Physical Activity Society. Um, Veronica is research manager with the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Group at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, a member of the research and content development team for participation report card, and project manager for the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines. She has a PhD in kinesiology and health studies from Queen's University. Well, hello, everyone, and good afternoon, and thank you so much for spending your after lunch time with us. Hopefully, you didn't have too big of a lunch and, and you fall asleep during this webinar, but the webinar does include some important health information on sleep, so if you do happen to need a nap, we do encourage you to do so, and we can wake you up near the end when we have some key messages for you. So this year's report card, uh, it look, really looked at physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And that's the question, to stem this creeping sleep epidemic in kids, do we need to get off the couch, get outdoors, and get their hearts pumping regularly? We found that it's time for a wake-up call, and that if Canadian kids sit less and move more, we'll all sleep better. Just a bit about the report card, if you guys haven't heard about it before. This is actually the 12th year of the report card's existence, and the first year that the report card, or sorry, the second year that the report card has been managed and produced by participation. The report card is the most comprehensive assessment of child and youth physical activity in Canada and really takes a whole of, um, lifestyle approach to looking at physical activity and kind of the state of the nation where it's at. So we have a group of researchers from across Canada, the research, report card research committee, and they grade the best available evidence. And we assign grades to 12 different indicators, and I'll show you the list of them in a few minutes. Every year, we now also include a knowledge product or kind of a key highlight on one particular topic. This year, we really looked at the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth and integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. This is the first of the kind in the world. So before this, we've been looking at guidelines kind of on their, on their own and in individual silos. And Veronica will speak to that in one second. And included in this is the first time that we've assigned a grade to sleep. And again, we'll go over all of the grades in a bit, but first we'll take a look at the 24-hour guidelines. So the 24-hour guidelines were developed by many different organizations in Canada. You can see the long list of them there, the organizations themselves, and there's even a longer list of experts from across Canada and around the world. And then tons and tons of stakeholders, everyone from healthcare professionals to even teens had input at, onto what they thought of the guidelines. The overarching message is that Children and youth need a combination of high levels of physical activity, low levels of sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep each day to be healthy. And now Veronica's going to go into the guidelines in more detail. Okay, 
Hey, thanks very much, Alana. So as Alana alluded to, there's more and more evidence that's beginning to show that movement-related behaviors interact to influence holistic health. So for example, physical activity is of course known to be important for health promotion and disease prevention, but there's evidence that the benefits of physical activity can be reduced if children have poor sleep habits or if they're engaging in excessive sedentary behaviors like screen time. Conversely, there's some evidence that increased physical activity could actually reduce the detrimental effects of having not enough sleep or of having extended periods of sitting in some individuals. And so it's the combination of behaviors that's really important with respect to health. And while it might seem counterintuitive to include sedentary behavior and sleep in a list of so-called movement behaviors, we do so in these 24-hour movement guidelines in the context of a movement continuum. So if we think about movement from no movement or very little movement all the way up to vigorous intensity exercise in order to capture the full components of a 24-hour day. And so, recognizing this integrated nature of these behaviors with respect to health, a process to develop Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth was undertaken, integrating all of these movement behaviors along the continuum. And without further ado, the final official Canadian guidelines look like this. So there's lots of information here on the slide. Hopefully you can all make out that text, um, but I will take you through it briefly here. So first at the top, as you can see, it states that for optimal health benefits, children and youth aged 5 to 17 years should achieve high levels of physical activity, low levels of sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep each day. This is the general summary statement of the guidelines, and there's more specific information for each of these behaviors in the visual representation of the guidelines and in the accompanying text. So as you can see, the visual representation of the guidelines is an outline of the number four, and it's divided into four segments to represent the four behaviors on the movement continuum. And the size of each segment is roughly proportional to the amount of recommended time spent in that behavior each day. So first, beginning with sweat, the corresponding movement behavior is moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, and the guidelines recommend an accumulation of at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity involving a variety of aerobic activities. Vigorous physical activities and muscle and bone strengthening activities should be incorporated at least three days per week. So what are these activities? Moderate intensity activities are activities that will cause children to sweat a little, breathe a little harder, and they should still be able to talk but not sing. And these are things like playground activities or riding a bike. Um, vigorous intensity activities are those that will cause children to sweat, to be out of breath, to the point that it's almost impossible to carry on a conversation. And these include things like running or swimming. So next is step, and this represents light intensity physical activity. And the recommendation for this is for several hours of a variety of structured and unstructured light physical activities. And these include things like quiet play, walking, playing with pets, or helping out with household chores. And the largest piece of the day is for sleep. And the sleep recommendations are for uninterrupted 9 to 11 hours of sleep per night for those aged 5 to 13 years, and 8 to 10 hours per night for those aged 14 to 17 years with consistent bed and wake up time. And sit represents sedentary behavior. And the recommendation for this is for no more than two hours per day of recreational screen time and limited sitting for extended periods. Finally, uh, preserving sufficient sleep, trading indoor time for outdoor time, and replacing sedentary behaviors and light physical activity with additional moderate to vigorous physical activity can provide greater health benefits. So to summarize, a healthy day requires a balance of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And children and youth need to sweat, step, sleep, and sit in the right amounts to be healthy. So who do these guidelines apply to? The guidelines are relevant to apparently healthy children and youth aged 5 to 17 years, irrespective of gender, race, ethnicity, or the socioeconomic status of the family. And they may also be appropriate for children and youth with a disability or a medical condition, although a health professional should be consulted for additional guidance. So how are the guidelines developed? These are evidence-based guidelines, and the process of creating guidelines that are based on scientific evidence is an absolutely enormous undertaking. And this is summarized in this figure here, which I recognize is quite small, so we'll just go through the key points together. So briefly, the process started by assembling an international panel of experts and stakeholders, and these experts identified a list of indicators of physical, psychological, or social, and cognitive health that are important to measuring kids. 
They then conducted four systematic reviews and one original research study in order to comprehensively examine the existing evidence and new evidence of the relationship between movement behaviors and each of the health indicators. So the systematic reviews summarized roughly 600 relevant scientific papers, and the original study synthesized measurements from a nationally representative sample of more than 4,000 Canadian youth. So this evidence then informed a draft version of the guidelines which was provided to roughly 700 stakeholders, and these stakeholders gave feedback both online and in person, and the feedback was incorporated into the final version of the guidelines while staying true to the research evidence. The final guidelines were released in June of 2016 along with the participation report card this year in both of Canada's official languages. So the full process took about two years from beginning to completion, and work to raise awareness and really activate the guidelines is still ongoing. So how do these guidelines compare to previous guidelines? So as Alana already mentioned, the physical activity and sedentary behavior portions of these guidelines are pretty similar to Canada's previous physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines for this age group, but there are some notable differences. So first, the previous physical activity recommendations focused on moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. But of course, we now have evidence that light intensity activities, like unstructured play and walking, are also important to incorporate each day for health benefits. And so for the first time, the guidelines include recommendations specific to light intensity physical activity. Second, until now, Canada has never had evidence-based sleep guidelines for any age group. And third, and most significantly, is the focus on how these different behaviors interact. For example, it's good to limit your screen time, but it's even better if you swap screen time for physical activity. So this is an, a focus of the new guidelines, uh, whereas previous guidelines for inde independent behaviors completely ignored the other behaviors. And so these guidelines really highlight that the whole day matters, and a healthy day requires a balance of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. So as stated in the guidelines, children and youth need to sweat, step, sleep, and sit in the right amounts to be healthy. If you want to learn more about the guidelines specifically, um, please visit the CSEP website. Here you'll find a 30-minute pre-recorded webinar in English and French, as well as a guideline development report that contains the same information as the webinar but in written form. And you'll also find a link to a special supplemental issue of the Journal of Applied Physiology, Nutrition, and Metabolism. This supplement is available online and is open access, so all nine papers are freely available. With that, I will turn it back over to Alana to take us through the report card grades. Thanks so much, Veronica, and I hope everyone knows already that their homework tonight is to repeat the four behaviors about 10 times really fast. So sweat, step, sleep, and sit, and keep doing it until you're, until you're able to do it as fast as you can. So next, as Veronica said, we'll look at the participation report card on physical activity for children and youth. And instead of going through all of the grades, we'll highlight some of the grades as they report to the, relate to the report card and the physical activity guidelines. First, so first off, as I mentioned, we usually highlight one specific topic or specific knowledge product in the report card. This year, we really looked at the sleep part of these guidelines. We know that many kids are too tired to get enough physical activity during the day and not enough activity during the day to be tired at night. So it's this vicious circle. When kids aren't sleeping, they're too tired, they can't move, they feel lethargic, and then it continues is that they don't want to move because they're too tired. And you see this, I'm sure you can all relate to this in your own lives when you have that restless feeling at night and you just don't sleep. We do know that, and this is true in adults as well, is that children's sleep duration has decreased over the last few decades by as much as one hour. And that about a third of kids and adolescents are sleep deprived, so they're not meeting the sleep guidelines. To go into the indicators and grades for the report cards, as I mentioned, we grade them with the help of an expert consensus group across the country, and they're based on the best available evidence. What are the indicators, you ask? So we really look at, like we said, the whole day and kind of a comprehensive look at physical activity. So all of the grades are interrelated, and they do fit into this larger schematic about what affects a child and what affects a child's ability to be physically active. 
the methodology, as I said many times, synthesizes the, the best available literature and tries to do this on an annual basis. So uses the most up-to-date literature. Like you may remember from school, we grade kids on the A to F. So A means we're succeeding with most children, and F means we're not doing so great. We're failing. We're succeeding with very few children and youth. We do consider a lot of things like trends over time, so how are we doing compared to 10 years ago, and presence of disparities. So are boys doing better than girls or vice versa? Is there a socioeconomic gradient? So are wealthier kids doing better than their, than their worse off peers? Stuff like that. We also take national level data as precedence over local or community data. Not saying we don't consider the two, it's just that there is a, a hierarchy here. And so that would include data like that from the Canadian Health Measures Survey or data from the Canadian Fitness and Lifestyle Research Institute. We do also put a call out every year, and this, we include this this year and, and include it as a call out to you guys on the call today, is if you do have data or if you do know of, do know of really cool studies or activities that are going on, please let us know. We always want to include more things and highlight different opportunities. This year, this is a list of grades. Sometimes they change from year to year. For example, we talked about including a sleep grade this year based on the new 24-hour guidelines and the importance of sleep that we're understanding more and more. So we go everywhere from overall physical activity, organized sport and physical activity participation, active play, active transportation, physical literacy, sleep, sedentary behaviors, family and peers, school, community in the built environment, government, non-government. And the government and non-government is really about strategies and investments. So what are the grades and indicators? So to relate back to the guidelines, we're just going to go over the daily behaviors today. And I'll show you how they kind of fit into each of the sweat, step, sleep, and sit aspects of the guidelines. The first one is overall physical activity. Unfortunately, this grade has remained a D- minus for many years now, primarily informed by the fact that only 9% of Canadian children and youth get at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day. Only 9%, you may think that is very bad. It is a very low proportion of children meeting the guidelines, but the grade is brought up a little bit by the fact that 70% of the younger children, so the three to four year olds, meet the recommendations of 180 minutes of daily activity at any intensity. So we know that younger children, they're not gonna have those really high intensity bursts because they're still learning how to walk, let alone run. So they get the 180 minutes of any intensity and those younger children are actually doing quite well. For the children and youth, so the five to 17 year olds, activity levels are actually declining as kids get older. So that we see a disparity there and the grade goes down a little bit more for that as well. We also know, and you guys on the call probably know this intuitively as well, that in general, boys are more active than girls, especially at these higher intensity activities. The next grade to look at is active play. You can think of this as a step part of the guideline. So it's a lot of this lighter intensity activities. The benchmark for this grade is several hours of structured and unstructured play each day. This is the first time that this, this indicator has been graded. Gave them a D plus based on new data from the CFLRI and from the Health Behaviors and School Age Children Survey from around the world. So we saw that 37% of 11 to 15 year olds play outdoors for at least two hours each day. So that's mainly during the after school period. And that we know that a lot of parents actually report that their kids participate in unorganized physical activity. But you see that in the graph at the bottom that in general, boys are participating in more activity than girls, similar to the overall physical activity grade and that very few children are meeting this greater than four hours a day benchmark, so the highest quadrant. So in, in the future, incorporating more step or light activities into a day is a great way to decrease sedentary time as well. A new study came out pretty recently that showed that just by nature of being outdoors, kids will decrease their sedentary time and increase their physical activity. So it's a great intervention. Just literally throw the kids outside and they'll be more active. Sleep is the biggest bar and the, the biggest proportion of the, of the day, as Veronica mentioned before. 
you may think that 79% of children that are getting enough sleep is a really great benchmark. And you know what, we agree. That's why it's a sleeping creep epidemic, sleep epidemic of kids not getting enough sleep per each night. Only about a third of kids are sleep deprived. This sounds pretty good, except that is still a large proportion of children, especially when you ask about the next question about the quality of the sleep. So how well are they sleeping at night? Are they sleepy during the daytime? Are they having trouble falling asleep? And you see, especially as kids get older, they're having more and more trouble falling asleep. That's where we get the worrisome part. And that relates to the next indicator of sedentary behavior, where we're unfortunately doing really, really poorly, and this grade was actually decreased this year. So most children across the board, from early years all the way up to late teens, are not meeting screen time guidelines of less than two hours per day of discretionary screen time. So as you see there, only 15% of three to four year olds are meeting this one hour benchmark. So their bench, the early years have a slightly lower guideline, so one out, less than one hour per day of discretionary screen time. 15% are meeting that. And then as we move to children and youth, 24% of five to 17 year olds are watching less than two hours of screen time per day. So what are some recommendations and how do we promote this within practice? and within the organizations that you guys work for. So physical activity, overall physical activity, the sweat part of this guideline, the 60 minutes or more of physical activity per day. The first one is to widely disseminate the new 24-hour movement guidelines. Yes, that is slightly self-serving because both HALO and participation were very engaged in this process. But we also think it is for the best case scenario for messaging and for guidance for parents, caregivers, everyone like that, because it really promotes this whole day. They can be active in small bursts throughout the day, and it really moves away from this idea that, that kids need that 60 minutes in one chunk, and the idea where you see a kid on a treadmill or anything crazy like that. That's not what we're saying. We want this whole day approach. So again, to the second point, support children and youth by adding bouts of physical activity throughout the day. So again, this throughout the day approach. Small bursts of physical activity before school, at recess, after school, in the evening, parents to engage with their children. And then the last one is to remove barriers for low-income families. I'm sure you all heard about the removal of the child fitness tax credit last year. We thought this was great. It maybe served the more affluent families a bit better than the lower income families, but how do we replace that? How do we make a better program to help low income families to let their kids participate in physical activity? Active play, so step. This is, the, again, remember this is lighter intensity physical activities. So increase awareness and understanding of the benefits versus the risks of outdoor play. Last year, maybe you guys are familiar with it, the report card was released alongside the position statement on active outdoor play. It really talked about letting your kids be outdoors. I mentioned earlier that if you just, by nature of being outdoors, you're more likely to meet the activity guidelines, you get less, physical, less sedentary behavior, less screen time. So just increase the awareness that, you know what, it's okay to be outside. And you know what, sometimes it's okay to be outside with no supervision and let kids play around, let kids get dirty, play in the dirt, play in the mud. It's almost winter time, let kids play with snow, that kind of stuff. Encourage parents to ensure a balance between structured and unstructured play. Again, this has a lot to do with the, the playing outside, letting kids be kids rather than signing up for 100 sports leagues. You know what, just throw a ball into a bunch of kids and I'm sure they'll have a really great time. Challenge municipal bylaws, and especially as we're moving into winter, I'm sure you guys have heard so many times about the, the snowball ban, the snow ban, the hockey ban, the every ban on the school field. Well, one good story, and this came out of the report card from last year, was that there was actually a reversal of the ban on street hockey in Toronto. So for a long time, there were signs up everywhere, banning street hockey was prohibited under a bylaw. You could get fined. So that went to court this year under the, um, under the assumption that it's actually harmful for kids because they're not allowed to get enough physical activity and it was reversed. So now kids are allowed to play ball hockey. So by just bringing these up and bringing them into public eye, we can understand that, you know what, you were able to play ball hockey when you were a kid and you probably loved it. So let our children and youth now have the same opportunities. 
sleep. So we encourage families to develop household bedtime rules. And a lot of these recommendations don't just apply to kids, but they apply to adults and even those without kids. You can apply these to your lives as well. So try to have consistent bed and wake times, so not only during the weekdays, but on the weekend. So if you get used to going to bed at 10.30 and waking up at 7, try to continue up throughout the weekend. More of a policy recommendation, but delaying school start time for adolescents. A lot of times adolescents end up having a different circadian rhythm than children or younger children or even adults. So sometimes they just naturally go to bed a bit later and need to wake up a little bit later. It will make that, make that they have a, a more productive day, they'll learn better, they'll be more encouraged to be physically active, and then we'll break that vicious, vicious cycle. I think the next point, I think this has been a bit of a turning of the tides in this area, that we understand more and more the benefits of sleep and the risks associated with short sleep. So don't think of sleep as a waste of time, think of it as a really great health intervention. And the last one just regards sleep as a preventive measure for waking. So we know that overall sleeping has huge effects on different levels of hormones and different um, things that are going on within your body throughout the day. This is another um, piece of, piece of a shareable that participation develops. So it's a general tip for having this healthy sleep hygiene. So we have this on the participation website. I just wanted to put it a little plug for it here. And it comes in a printable, shareable um, eight and a half by 11 that you can put up. Just ideas to make your, your room more conducive to sleep. So things like exercise regularly, go to bed at the same time, develop a relaxing routine. And my favorite one is make reserve your bedroom for sleeping only. So keep cell phones, televisions out of the bedroom. Try to make sure your bedroom is where you sleep and then turning off the screens well before bedtime. Finally, recommendations for sedentary behavior. So similar to sleep, develop household rules around screen time. Turn off the Wi-Fi between certain hours, especially near bedtime so that kids are getting to bed on time. And this applies to adults again as well. Try not to check Twitter after 10 p.m. Try to develop something relaxing for you and that may include turning off your emails, turning off the, the beeps, the sounds, everything like that. Remove screens and media devices from the bedroom. Again, we can't stress this, this enough. It's been shown over and over again that having these devices in the bedroom is not healthy and it can actually bring about indicators for poor health in all age groups. And the last one, remember to, to set good role modeling for yourself as well. Your children will do what you do. So if they see you on your phone all the time or in front of the TV, in front of the computer, they'll understand that that is a social norm. That's something that you do. So I like to say, you wouldn't have cotton candy for breakfast. That's just not what we do. So you don't use the screen after 8 p.m. That's just not what you do. And so moving forward, how to promote a healthy 24 hours. We have a ton, a ton, a ton of tools and resources, and we're continually developing more. Participation at HALO and then the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology have a partnership all together to bring them the guidelines to life. So in the next couple of months, next couple of years, you'll see more and more resources as well. Currently, these are the resources we have. So the highlight report. So this is the, the eight page report on the, the participation report card. It includes the guidelines. They are free to order. So our contact information is at the end and I encourage you to send me an email. If you want 50, 100, we're happy to send them over and they're a really great leave behind, especially if you're at a conference or workshop. You can download the full report, and that has all of the citations and studies that we, that we reference throughout the report card. The 24-hour movement guidelines, and as Veronica mentioned, these are open access. You can access them through CSAP, through participation, or through HALO, so there's lots of ways to get at them. Past report cards. I did mention things like the position statement on active outdoor play. Lots of the previous report cards have some really great points and really great stats, really great resources that you can use. Those are all available on the participation website, along with PowerPoint presentations, media kit, social media kit, and shareables, infographics that, like I showed you with the sleep infographic, we're developing more and more kind of as we go on. And if you have a request for that, we're happy to hear it. We're happy if there you have a specific need or anything like that. We're happy to work with you to see what we can do. And then web portal and develop, guideline development for eight other age groups. 
So the guideline development for the early years, so for those zero to four-year-olds, that's ongoing at this very moment. So in the next year or so, you'll see 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years. And then subsequent to that, we will develop guidelines for adults and older adults. So the plan is to have a whole suite of 24-hour movement guidelines, similar, not the same, to the guidelines that exist right now. The report card development team, there's a long list of people that help out with the report card, including students, researchers from across the country, and same with the guideline development team. So there's a 27-member consensus a panel that works on the guidelines and then the organizations at the bottom that provided feedback, support, financial support, all of that. And then I think we wrapped up quite quickly. So we have lots of room for questions or you can get back to your desk. But if you do want any additional information, you can send me an email or send participation an email um, and check out any of the websites or the organizations below. Well, thanks very much, uh, Lana and Veronica. It's a really interesting presentation. I'll open it up now to questions. We've got about 20 minutes. Uh, our first question uh, that's come in is, uh, you mentioned more, no more than two hours of screen time per day. What happens at school as well? So the two hours of screen time, and I should have mentioned that this is a question we get fairly often. So the two hours of screen time is really discretionary screen time. So during the school day, we realize that, especially as we incorporate technology into our daily lives, that schools will use different screens to help bring their subjects to life. So the discretionary screen time is in the after school period, in the evening, anything like that. So it's really that after school. In school, we do recommend still to reduce screen time whenever possible to have real life examples and interact outdoors especially. But yeah, it's really that discretionary after school. Thanks. Uh, next question is, what if I work with young children where screen time recommendations are no more than one hour? That's a great question as well. And you know what, in all of the sedentary behavior research, the general consensus is that actually less is better. So in an ideal world, we'd all be getting kind of zero hours of screen time. There are very few redeeming factors on screen time. There are, yes, I know there are lots of one-off examples, especially around rehabilitation or things like that. But if you're working with the young kids, imposing a one-hour limit on screen time for the older kids as well, you know what, you may be doing everyone actually a really big favor because less screen time will probably help the older kids as well. They're probably getting screen time when they're not with you as well. So that one hour mark is probably a really great benchmark to work with. Thanks very much. Next question from Monica is, uh, SIP guidelines are two hours per day yet school guidelines are six hours? That's a question. Yeah, and I think there's another one afterwards as well about sitting or sedentary activities like reading. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this screen time is really the two hours per day. We recommend reducing or breaking up your sedentary behavior like reading or like we understand that if you go on a long car trip, you're gonna, you may be sitting for longer periods of time, but breaking this up. So maybe read for a little bit and then get up and do an activity or walk around or if you're coloring, maybe you can set up something like a standing desk. The overall sedentary behavior guidelines, there are definitely some benefits to things like reading related to academic achievement or different language um, development things or things like that. Really this, this screen time, so computer, video games, searching stuff online, using Snapchat or different smartphones, stuff like that, that's where the, the more harmful effects of screen time, and yes, outside of school, so during the afternoon. I don't know if Veronica wants to contact you. Yeah, if I can just add to that, so as Alana said, it's really about limiting screen time to less than two hours, mm -hmm. and of course the school period is longer than that. And so the sitting part comes in in that we want to limit sitting for extended periods of time. So this is why recess breaks are important, or if there can be any activities during a class where teachers can get students up out of their chairs moving around, it often helps with their focus during a lesson and their engagement in a lesson. So in addition to the health benefits of breaking up those periods of sitting, it can also have benefits for academic achievement and uh, just overall engagement in school. So although the, the two hours of screen time it is mostly discretionary time, as Alana mentioned, during the school day there are still ways to implement the sedentary behavior portion of the guideline. 
And to borrow from some adult literature as well, we know that going for things like walking meetings or uh, interacting in more of a more of an engaging fashion, especially when it's outdoors, as I keep mentioning, actually improves creativity and kind of that outside of the box thinking. So around the new ideas and, and new solutions to ideas. So incor incorporating that throughout the day, as Veronica mentioned, can be really beneficial for the teacher as well. They may be a little bit more sane by the end of the day. Great. Our next question uh, from both Sarah and Frank are asking whether there is data available for provinces and territories or even uh, region specific data and if so, where would that be found? I would love to tell you that we have that data. Unfortunately, we don't. We get asked this question all the time and we do try to make provincial level highlights within the report card. It's very, very tricky data to have and sometimes even if we do have it for one province, it's not consistent from province to province. Um, so unfortunately, we do not have kind of provincial level report cards. Uh, it would be great if you have any suggestions or any ways to combat this kind of data gap or research gap. We'd love to hear them, and we love to get contacts in that area. And we're always trying to trying to fix this. So sorry about that. Okay, next question from Lison is, uh, she mentions sedentary behavior is also drawing, making puzzles, reading a book, et cetera. So what about the time for those activities? So there's, there's sort of limited data on content of sedentary behavior, um, but what data there is absolutely suggests that the type of activity uh, has a different impact. So reading is not the same as watching TV. And the most uh, evidence that we have is for screen time and the importance of limiting that. Um, but sitting quietly and drawing or doing a puzzle, those are things that have cognitive engagement and can have benefits that are completely distinct of the lack of movement that's happening at that time. Uh oh, thank you from Lison. Thanks very much, Lison. Uh, next question from Natalie is, uh, she's wondering where she can get the general tips for having healthy sleep hygiene um, that you presented. So I, I know you mentioned it's online. Maybe we can send that to folks um, following the webinar. Yep, for sure we can. And it has a little blurb about what sleep hygiene is and why it's important as well. So it's a really neat handout to have and to either print off and give to people or post on social, anything like that. It's available in both English and French on the participation website in the report card section. But um, yeah, we'll send it out as well. Great. Um, next question is, what can I do to implement um, the new guidelines at work? So I'm going to assume that you work with children because they are children guidelines, although they are um, really meant to be, be sent out to parents and caregivers as well. So a really great way to put them, to, to implement them or to disseminate them, I guess, is to put them up. The report card highlight report is really cool because it's actually a fold a poster that folds out. One side is a picture of a little girl with kind of different facts and stats about why the different, the 24-hour movement behavior guidelines are important. And then the other side has the guidelines themselves and the grades for each indicator. So that's a really cool thing to have up. And we often get requests not only to have at least two copies so that people can, can post them, but as well to have additionals to give out to people. As mentioned, the guidelines are included in the highlight report. So having something like that as a leave behind or to hand out to parents, to caregivers, really great. As well, just kind of promote this whole day matters in this 24-hour clock that we're looking at. So we're not just looking at one behavior and we're not just looking at one hour of the day, but this continual small bouts of physical activity, reducing sedentary time, increasing light activity. And if you're doing all of that, you're more likely to have a good night's sleep and then the cycle will continue that way. So really this, this whole day approach and then kind of spreading that message with others as well. And we've had a really great response for that. I think it's intuitive that you're like, especially with kids, that the whole day does matter and no one expects a, ch a child to jump on a treadmill and go for a 30 minute run or anything like that. It, it really is this continual movement. Excellent. And there's questions still coming in. So uh, next question from Carrie is uh, with regards to the no pets in the bedroom guideline. And she's just wondering about the rationale behind that. So it's, it's really about disturbing your sleep patterns. So of course it's different for different people. There are even some therapy dogs who are encouraged to sleep with their owners or encouraged to sleep with the child. So if you have a pet and that's become part of your normal bedtime routine, we do get this question, 
then that's fine and I wouldn't worry about it. It's more about disrupting or disturbing your sleep patterns. So we want this good quality, undisturbed, uninterrupted sleep. Often having a pet in your bed may wake you up. They may move around, something like that. It's just an easy way. If you get that out of the bedroom, you'll be asleep by yourself without additional movement to wake you up. If you do have a pet that you love and you want in your bed or not, don't kick them out. That's fine because it may help you psychologically as well. But it just is another way to have a, have a bedroom that's quiet and meant for sleeping. Mm, great question. Uh, next question from Richard is, when you provide information to parents, do you also recommend that they allow their children to walk to, walk to and from school, um, building activity into their daily routine or commute? Yep, great question. So those who do commute actively, or at least partway actively, are more likely to meet physical activity guidelines, and that's above and beyond the activity involved in the, the active commuting. So they're just more active. So maybe you're, if you went straight home after school, your, your walk home would be 10 minutes long, but usually the kids that are walking that 10 minutes end up taking 20 or half an hour because they stop and play. They stop in and muck around or have this free play or unstructured activity that we're promoting. So yes, definitely do encourage this. It's also we know that more and more parents who are dropping off their kids this drop-off zone or the zone right around schools actually becomes quite dangerous for kids. So there's a fair amount of injuries just based on having so many cars, so many people in such an enclosed area. It's actually safer to promote these walking school buses. We highlighted a really cool one that's been getting some traction called Toti Bus, started in Quebec, has moved into Ontario, where we actually have chaperones or kind of these walking school bus patrollers that will pick up kids at various spots along the route so that they have a semi-supervised walk to school as well. And I think a lot of parents understand that and feel a bit more comfortable with that as well. I think the guidelines are generally no more than 1.6K away. You can't walk at that point, but there is a possibility that a parent drives a kid to closer to the school and then they walk or bike from there scooter, rollerblade, any of those things that are easy to take. And of course, if you are biking, then teach your children the rules of the road, all that kind of stuff. But we know, do know that the, the, there's an additive effect of having additional safety features, so safe routes to school, including crossing guards or walking school bus monitors or slow down zones near school or proper bike lanes or sidewalks. Every additive factor makes it a safer and more conducive way to go to school. The more people walk to school or bike to school, the more people do it on top of that. So definitely encourage kids to do it. And the more that they do it, the more others, and we'll have this, this kind of overwhelming walk to school. Great. Uh, question from Sam. Is there a research around the screen time related to tasks? For example, um, Snapchat versus educational apps. So at this point, we really don't have that kind of evidence. It's, it's such an important area of research, and the types of technology that we have are changing so quickly. Um, you know, we have Twitter and FaceTime and on all of these different things, and at this point, we just don't have enough resolution to be able to comment on the specific, the specific types. And unfortunately, by the time that a researcher hears about a new trend, it's probably over and your 14-year-old is onto two trends ahead of that. So it is really hard to keep in line with the most uh, up-to-date or the, the most widely used apps in that age group. The other big question around that, and it relates to this as well, is around sedentary multitasking. So monitoring screen time, say you're doing homework on your laptop, so you're doing a good behavior there check, but you're also watching TV using Snapchat, you're watching TV on your TV, rare probably occurrence for most people, but you're watching TV, you're using your phone for Snapchat, you have a magazine or a YouTube video open on your iPad, and then you're actually doing your homework on, on the computer. So how do we classify that or how do we provide a public health message that's really getting at the negative versus positive behaviors there? really, really interesting and really good research. So definitely look forward to the answer. <laughs> so next question, uh, what about policy? What can be done to encourage supportive policies? That's a pretty loaded question and I agree. It is a very hard question as well, but I think it's these 
moving the social norms or moving the needle on what we accept our kids to do and what we want to encourage our kids to do. So hushing or quieting down those few voices that are really loud, unfortunately, but around the ball hockey bands, around the no snowballs in the playground, and really encouraging kids that, or other parents, mostly, or adults, that, you know what, kids want to be kids. Just think back to the day when you were younger and what you really enjoyed and what you thought were fun. Nowadays, if you go to a playground, it's often these kind of prefab playgrounds or prefabricated blocks and things that don't really move or aren't really engaging, and then kids end up being bored. So then they don't want to play it, so then they end up being sedentary. And, and we look at these playgrounds and say, well, why is no one there? We built it. Well, you know what, maybe we're overbuilding it. Maybe we just have to change these norms around that. You know why it's okay for kids to walk and play and play in the mud and do all these things by themselves sometimes as well and, and reduce the amount of kind of hyper parenting or um, helicopter parenting that we see. Thanks for that. Next question from Sam. Is there a different level of disparity for children in childcare versus uh, not in childcare? Sorry, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Maybe Veronica would better no disparity in terms of. Yeah, Samantha, maybe you can if you can send in clarification. I would. I think she's probably talking about physical activity levels. I think it, if if that is the case, and I'll just mention talk about that until until we we do get a bit of clarification. The the disparities between after school programs, or really depends on who's running them as well. Uh, more and more, we've been encouraging, and I think there's been actually a really great response about professional or accredited people to teach physical education and sports program, programming after school. So not just the fact that it's available, but that you have a gym teacher teaching gym rather than, a, say, a drama teacher who's maybe not as educated or as understanding of what it takes. The same with after school and uh, daycare situations, things like that. The person who's the best champion or the best educated champion in terms of physical activity, sedentary behavior, is probably de uh, delivering a much different program than someone who doesn't have an interest or any education or support materials or anything like that to deliver a quality program. So I would say it's more based on the program itself, program to program, than overall. Great, hopefully that answered. Oh, uh, she sent clarification that she was asking about uh, activity levels and also sleep. I don't know if you commented on sleep. I'm not aware of any information on that particular one, unfortunately. There, there would be some pretty high child-to-child -child variability in that as well. Just we know that so few kids that are meeting the guidelines, I don't, I don't know how you could parse that out anymore. So it, it definitely is interesting. Um, we're not sure. All right. Hopefully that, that helps uh, respond to your questions, Samantha. Um, so the next question from Richard, speaking of multitasking, what about encouraging people to be active while engaging in screen time? It may apply better to youth and adults, um, but example, hopping on an exercise bike, treadmill, rather than sitting on a couch. You know what, there's not much, actually there's no information on this. Why I know that there's no information on this is that we're starting a study on this very soon. So we will be looking at the different effects of jumping on an exercise bike and watching TV versus just jumping on an exercise bike versus using it with music, different cases like that. Uh, especially with the advent of different types of technologies and handheld technologies and wireless and all this other stuff that you can bring into a gym, it is really curious to see if there's any kind of compensating behaviors after the fact. So did you find it easier and therefore you, you behave differently in those after physical activity bouts? Don't know, we'll be looking into that. So, so we'll give you an answer in probably a year. <laughs> Oh, Sam, uh, Samantha, just thanks. I think you've responded to your question. She also just had another comment about um, the fact that children can be in care, uh, in care from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. and there's just less time for families to influence behaviors of their children. Um, and a comment from Lisa related, to, I guess, sort of relates to that uh, comment from Samantha, but also your discussion about policies. And she mentions that the BC Child Care Licensing have just modified regulations so that all of their programs have to have a policy around screen time and have to meet a set amount of physical activity per day. And uh, I don't know if you uh, have any comments with regards to that sort of child care policy uh, angle. I do know that there is more and more of a push to have mandated physical activity and 
uh, written policies around physical activity, both in childcare and school settings. And I think that's uh, kind of the majority of centers do have something now, and that varies by incredible margins from province to province because it also depends how regulated your child care is from province to province. Um, but, but yes, and I think that's becoming almost the new norm. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is working on a pan-Canadian physical activity strategy and hopefully they will be including something like that, maybe not now, but in the future as well. And just to touch on the, the comment about families, um, it actually brings up a really good point in terms of being active as a family. So even if you're limited as time, with time, you know, the whole family going in the backyard, throwing around a ball, going for a walk, anything like that, it, it's a good time uh, to be together as a family and to get some physical activity because we all need it, not just the kids. Thanks. So uh, next question. This is one is a good one to end on. We've got only a couple minutes left. So uh, here's the question. What's next? What, will there be guidelines for other age groups? Absolutely. So the process, uh, that big two-year process that I mentioned is currently underway for the early years. Um, so we're in the process of gathering all of the evidence for that age group. And uh, there is a plan to do the same process for adults and older adults as well. So eventually, as Alana mentioned, there will be a full suite of 24-hour guidelines covering all of the age groups in Canada. Great. And any final thoughts you want to leave with our attendees? I think you should probably all go for a walk right now. <laughs> Good suggestion. Well, thanks very much, um, Dr. LeBlanc and Dr. Poitras. It's been really fascinating presentations, and uh, clearly you've engaged our attendees, and it's been a really fabulous discussion. Um, hopefully, it's been, uh, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the presentations, those on the line, and hopefully we'll see you again in the future uh, on another webinar. So thanks very much, everyone, and uh, give you an extra minute to start that uh, walk or physical activity in your day, and uh, have a great rest of the day.